Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Rikindi. Today we're joined by Vicky Andrews. Uh, Vicky, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Vicky, tell us a little bit about your journey. So um, I know that you're into minimalism. Um, what exactly is that? What does that look like for people who've never heard about it before? Um, and how can they get involved? Wonderful. Yes, I think people maybe are expecting that I'm living in a shoebox or that I've <laughs> thrown out all my stuff. Uh, which is not the case. I'm living this minimalist concepts about what's best for me. So some things I have a lot of still, uh, some things I have very few or none of, which is all part of what I'm saying is it just is whatever fits for the right person. Uh, for me, I just had too much of everything, too much mental clutter, too much physical clutter, just too much going on. So uh, the journey for me was about all three pieces. <laughs> Beautiful. With minimalism, so you had too much stuff and then you decided, like, did you read a book? Was there something that spurred that or? Yeah, it's quite the truth of the matter. Um, I did separate from my partner and I had um, to divide my things up. And so going through um, what I wanted and where I could you know, realistically live, uh, I started to go, I actually don't need all this. I don't need to fight over any of this stuff. I don't need it. I've got things that mean something to me that I'd love to have. Um, but what could I live with and not what could I live without? And the pile of what I could live without was pretty big. <laughs> wow. So you started going through all your stuff and you were like, no, nah, don't need this, don't need this. Yeah, don't and don't want this. to fight over it. So many people are fighting over these physical items, especially when they're going through a change like that. Mm. Uh, and even though we were quite amicable, it was still looking at um, items and wanting them just because they were an expensive cup or um, you know, expensive linen rather than – just the linen that you needed. Mm, mm. No, that's that's really true. Like, I think particularly in this current era, we're so obsessed with consumption. Everybody, you know, particularly with social media, it's like you can't be this – everyone wants to be this ideal self and they don't know how to get there. And so they'll look at all these people that seem to have this – perfect world and instead of them thinking okay well maybe let me try and work on myself they think all right well if I buy this it'll make me happy so I'm gonna quickly go buy this and buy this and you can live in a Pinterest house but be like so miserable yep yeah it's it went from us like five at least five bedroom three bathroom over three levels down to a one bedroom flat and I couldn't be happier wow (laughs) wow so what was that like like what uh, there's a lot of um, accepting that you're let, like letting go. You have to let it go. And um, a lot of accepting that when you drive past that old house, you might have some pangs of what it was like and remember all those beautiful things about living in that environment. But was it really the physical building or, or was it that you're in a safe suburb and your children were happy? And I'm in a safe suburb and my children are happy wherever I've found to live. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And so what have you done with that? So now you've had this realisation of decluttering your life, getting rid of everything. Um, what did that journey lead to? Um, I get a little bit obsessed sometimes. So at the moment, everything in the home has to have a dual purpose. Otherwise, I don't have it. So we don't have a jug or a toaster. Um, we have a convertible bed that is a dining table, a desk, and then at night it's our bed. Yep. So I, I can get right down that rabbit hole, though, of getting super excited when something can do more than three things, like four or five, and then I want to replace you know, what I have. Yep. Um, so, yeah, the house is quite funky. I ha- quite often have people want to just FaceTime me to see my new, <laughs> new thing that I've bought that converts. Yeah. Um, the two out, uh, two, one in, two out. So recently my son's birthday, any gifts that he has, he's got to go through and find. If he brings one in, he's got to leave two things out. Um, and lucky for us, we're able to give things to charity. So that's been a beautiful experience as well. That's cool. So do you live like on a um, a tiny house or something? Is that it's, No, it's just a one-bedroom flat So um, in Spring Hill. So yeah. I looked at tiny house concepts. They're actually quite big compared to where I am. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah. And your space, because I know um, Mary Kondo, for those listening, uh, she's quite big on, uh, it's a book, um, it's like, she's what a, makes you happy or something? Yeah, she's an organiser, I would say as well. She likes yep. to organise what you have. Yeah. Um, What's Box Joy? That's it. That's the one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, 
you know, uh, kind of getting a system and making sure everything, you know, fits neatly she started with. I think she now is going more towards um, what doesn't serve you, you don't mm. need to keep. So. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Because everything does have, in a way, if you if you are more aware, everything that should be in your environment should sh- serve a purpose. And not just a purpose of, oh, maybe one day I'd like to wear this at some point. <laughs> but a purpose of like, this actually brings me joy. This looks beautiful. I take care of what I have. Um, I love, nourish what I have and then you start to, I imagine, nourish yourself and, and love yourself through that process. You have the time too as well because you're not spending all that time moving things around or, you know, when I go to get dressed, there's only a few choices and I love all of them. So there's still that debate of, you know, which thing am I going to wear? But it's not through piles and piles of things. It's just which one's most appropriate and how am I feeling today? Mm. And I jump in and I feel amazing. So for those like, okay, who've started out, they've got all of the stuff around them and um, they're like, okay, maybe this is something that I'm interested in. Maybe Manila's, I've heard about it, you know, it's come around, but like, what do I actually do to start to sort my life out? What does that even look like? Well, yeah, we say just begin. That's Minimalism is just about beginning anywhere that, that you find. But I think the most successful technique I've seen is boxing everything. So buying a whole bunch of those plastic crates, which sounds funny because you've gone out and purchased more, Yeah, but you can see what's inside them. So it takes a bit of the anxiety out of those people who don't like to seal it up in a cardboard box. Mm. So trying to package everything up and then when you need something, you go, where's the tongs for the kitchen? Mm. I can tell you tongs are an essential, but yeah. <laughs> then, then you go and find them and they come back out. So it's only when you need it that mm. you then produce it from the box. That's interesting. Um, and you you never touch if there were 10 boxes, you won't touch eight of them. Yeah, wow. Mm. And clothing, same thing. You just leave them in there. Same. So put them all away. Maybe keep out 10 items. Mm. doesn't even matter what 10. Uh, there's the coat hanger trick of turning them backwards. And if it never turns around, it means you never wore it. Mm. So you can face them all one way. Mm. But you know, as the rainy day comes and you realize you want a jumper because it's cold, go and grab one. Mm. One. Mm. <laughs> and then see if that's all you need. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. And you find that through that process, you are not as – um, stressed. Uh, what, talk us through yeah, that. It's, it's a lot more peaceful. There's a lot less work to do, a lot less ironing, washing, folding, stacking. Mm. Um, I do get quite discerning with fabric. So um, a lot of my jumpers will have wool or cashmere in them because then they are warm. So you don't need seven jumpers or layers because the one you have fit, is fit for purpose. Mm. So I've got a lot more deliberate around good quality fabrics, good brands that last a long time and actually fit the purpose they were made for yep. um so i when i travel i know i've got everything that i need because it all converts mm. you know, and mm. it's all weather all season yeah well what actually like really attracted me um to you when i saw minimalism um i actually live in a small cabin um it's totally off grid it's um and it's one room so it is it's very tiny <laughs> um and through that process I've had like okay prior to that I was living in the city and I was living in this beautiful apartment and I was like right in the water and I had all these clothes I had a whole stack of shoes and I was like oh I loved it and then um I went traveling um and this was during 2020 so I had a backpack and I put everything in this backpack and I left March 2020 and by April May things started getting bad and then everyone was in lockdown. So I was in Southeast Asia and had this backpack and I was like, damn, <laughs> I can't really get back now. <laughs> so I spent an entire year living out of this backpack. And then when I got back, I was like, I can't go back to that life. Like I can't go back to that apartment life. I can't go back. You know, it's more like just the, all the clothes, all the shoes, all the stuff. Um, and yeah, mm. like coming into the small cabin, I've, just live with the clothes, you know, um, that I traveled with, like one or two more. And um, it's it's been an adjustment. Like occasionally if I walk through the stores or something, I'm like, oh, man, there's so many nice clothes. And I'm like, no, you, do, you don't need it. Like what mm-hmm. does it do but bring me joy in that moment? And then I just never wear it. And I'm wasting money. I'm wasting time. And then you open your drawer and you see all these clothes and there's Tags just like even. clutter <laughs> and like – it actually gives you anxiety sometimes seeing all that stuff that like you either haven't worn or, you know, it's just taking up space. And I'm not perfect. I will still go out to a sale and come home and then I feel it straight away. Mm. And so I just deliberately sit down and go, okay, something's got to go. And it mm. could be the thing that just came in. And I could, lucky if I've kept my receipt, I could return it. Yeah. But that's taken a long time to get to that point. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. So I, I still purge and spend and then purge (laughs) every now and then yeah so what do you do to then like kind of keep you in track to you know I think it finds its own balance because you know what the feeling 
the, me- the muscle memory says, when yeah. I get all these bags home, I'm not going to f- feel good. I know I'm not. Mm. Um, so just checking yourself. And, and I do give myself limits sometimes. So if life's in a more difficult patch and I think um, retail therapy mm. is what I need, I will deliberately go shopping for a certain item. Mm. So I might look at everything, but all I'm going to purchase today is a new T-shirt and yep. I know which one I'm already getting rid of. Mm. So I'm mm. just a bit more deliberate is the only thing I could say. Yeah, because I I actually, like, when you look at the economy, like, the whole society, I feel like it almost um, emphasizes or fuels consumption. So everywhere you look, like we are saying before, you know, it's buy, 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 buy. And it's almost like if everyone stopped buying, I think the economy would collapse. And so there's kind of, like, a way to uh, motivate people to do that. But I I do think that the way they're doing it is so bad for our mental health um, and and then obviously our pockets as well, our financial wealth, (laughs) because you're just fueling it completely into to these quick kind of things. And, um, you know, I'm sure there's many other ways in which um, the economy could run that doesn't fuel on overconsumption. You know, mindful consumption um, is obtainable. It's just this... um, need for more yes and it can cost to buy a quality item so sometimes people don't see that they go i'm only getting one jumper for two hundred dollars i could buy seven at this other store Mm. um the fact is the seven will never make you happy or keep you warm or provide a function so you're better off saving the money towards that one classic piece Mm. that you will keep forever Mm. and you will love and you will care for it and you will repair it Mm. and you will dry clean it if you need to that's so true, so yeah. true. And a lot of it's also made from plastic. Like the mm-hmm. amount of times you can actually take – look in the back and it's like polyester. And if that catches a light, it would literally just <laughs> completely – yeah, it's so bad. Yes, you can ask my girls every time they send me a photo or FaceTime me when they're shopping – and I'll go, turn it over, where's the label? Where's the label? Show me what it's made of. Yeah. No, you can't have that. That's 100% nylon. No, put it back. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So, good. Um, so I saw that you spoke about the space, the headspace in the future um, on your website about minimalism. Talk, for those listening, like talk us through that. Mm. What, what are each of those sections? Yes. So everyone always thinks of the clutter and that probably resonates quite strongly with me. My, my mother is a hoarder. If you've ever seen those shows on TV, um, you can't get a meter inside the front door without having to fish your way through everything. Mm. And I often wonder if that's why I like minimalism, but I, I just, I don't remember it being like that. I just now see her as someone who's consumed by things, but it's always that, um, you know, cleaning up your space is what everyone thinks. Mm. But for me, cleaning up your space, as you mentioned, leads to the mental declutter, so you're not consumed by it all. You don't, you've got all this time to actually think or you travel because you don't have to have someone water all your plants, feed your fish, um, you know, uh, come and do all these jobs associated that you've created in your life. Mm. So the mental space then comes. You're not financially as stressed, so you do relax a lot more. Uh, and that led me into future space, which was building economical and tiny spaces, furniture and things where we could live a lot simpler and smaller and off the grid. So, yeah. yeah don't know. So, so building those sort of spaces as in? Yeah, so not being the builder of it, so partnering with someone who has the fabrication part, but I designed a thing called the To-Go, which is um, the off-the-grid office. So T-O-G-O, uh, fully off-the-grid, generates its own power, um, you know, you can move it anywhere, live anywhere, uh, and the concept's fine. It's still um, the law needs to catch up a lot around where you could place these sort of yep. tiny living spaces. Yeah, wow. Because I thought um, if it's three by three, you can get by it with council because it's under the keeping limit. it on wheels. Yeah, There's a lot of yeah, it's, anti on wheels. Yeah, it's well. still it's still quite hard. Yeah, mm. and I think we're getting there. There's lots of communities trialing and testing these sorts of ways of living. Um, I'd love to see it as the norm. Yeah. Mm, that would be so nice. Well, I know. If, like speaking from my own personal mm-hmm. experience, like living off grid compared to in the city has changed my life. It's mm-hmm. waking up in nature is is insane. Like I literally, I, I pinch myself. There's, I literally wake up with birds singing to me. That's <laughs> beautiful. It yeah. is very. Yeah. Ta- it's ideal. And then, and then at night, there's like little fireflies, and mm-hmm. they're like, and I think you know, with the, this amount, um, people could buy like a house somewhere, right? But this is just, it's so much richer. Mm. And even though it's smaller and even though my kitchen and my bedroom and my study is in one room, <laughs> it's just there's this richness of being um, that's hard to... Um, you can't compare to it. You know? no. And if you have to be in the city, that 
that still generates ideas for me. So even during COVID when a lot of the big corporate buildings where I worked were all vacant, mm. I went, why don't we have an entire floor that are one-bedroom flats and turn the bathrooms in the middle to communal bathrooms and people might want to live here because they don't have their car anymore and they could work two floors up, get in the lift and go home. Yeah. Like they all look down the river, they're beautiful views and they were mm. empty and they're now still empty because not everyone wants to come back into the city. Um, making a more conventional space that could con- – sorry, convertible space in the city in these apartments would be amazing. Mm. Um, mm. That's really true, actually. And I think community plays a big part in that. It's like the more people that are together in one space can actually create a sense of um, belonging yeah. where in the present-day society where we're just more about consumption, there's not a need for close – Sharing. Share, yeah. yeah. So in the military, I li- obviously lived in dorms. Um, from like 17 years old. I lived in a room with four other people for my first part of my training. And then I lived in my own space with four other people in their space, sharing the bathroom and the kitchen and the lounge room. So I've lived all these ways. And then you eventually move out and buy your own big house and all that community is gone, all that Mm. sharing of the milk or, you know, just just generally being respectful of other people in a space Mm. goes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, and I think for like, um, I think one of the biggest things for COVID was the depression from isolation, and so people living in an isolated space. Um, I know a few friends that had beautiful apartments, but they were alone. It was just them, and in Melbourne was the worst. There were like months of not being able to leave, not seeing anyone. I mean, like far out. Yeah, not a not, not a lot of natural light coming into their spaces. Very depressing mm. for everyone. Mm. Mm. So I saw um, this other beautiful quote. And it was like, um, "To be content doesn't mean you don't desire more. It means you're thankful for having the patience for what's to come." Um, and I just I love that quote. It's a beautiful quote. Yeah, mm. it's just gorgeous. And also, just I think it's um, it's not the the stopping of wanting more in minimalism. It's feeling like you have the perfect amount of everything. Mm. Mm. So and just waiting for that um, when you're ready. You know, if if I don't need this now, but like, you know, I'm okay. I know what in the future, like maybe I may need that, but now I, I have enough. Yeah. And need and want, like working out what is a need and what is just something you want. So needs are very basic, mm. very, very basic. <laughs> so talk us through that for people. Who listen. Like what's the, what, how would you define needs and how would you define wants? Mm. I think needs can be a little bit more spiritual and emotional. So we all need love and warmth and comfort. We absolutely need all of those things. And um, then we want a lifestyle that then produces all these items that we might need to have a lifestyle that we want. So it's a hard distinction. But if you want to you know, entertain lots of guests in your house, you're going to need some extra cutlery because mm-hmm. that's a need to have that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. If you change the lifestyle though and you no longer needed to have dinner parties or sorry, no longer wanted dinner parties, you no longer need all this cutlery. Um, so, yeah, the, the lifestyle you design actually determines a lot of the things that you purchase. Mm. And so you've got to focus on that. What kind of life do you want? Mm. Um, you know, and some things are expensive, some things are cheap to decide on, but you've got to keep living the life that you want and redesigning it. So if you try it and it doesn't feel great, redesign it try again and when you say reflection comes a big part of that because you would mm-hmm. sit down you would reflect okay well like where am i now what does this look like because so many people like just walk through life and don't understand if they're going in the right direction and mm-hmm. that that coming back to presence that reflection of, of yeah and, and that it's okay that you went down a path that didn't suit you but why would you stay there mm-hmm. <laughs> and be brave enough to go i'm going to have a go at something else mm-hmm. so i can imagine there would be this um fear of like losing your image as such like if I break up with this partner you know then I won't have this um, image that I'm portraying of being perfect. If I don't live in this suburb or if I don't live in this style of home all of those things we tag to who we are they're not Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're not who we are we're actually more um, able to show who we are when we have a simpler life. Wow. Wow. So I wouldn't be able to come here if I was still cleaning a seven bedroom house. <laughs> and I wouldn't have time. I'd still be at home doing the housework, you know? Wow. Yeah. And I'm, I imagine you would feel quite isolated yeah. at that, you know, surrounded by stuff, but yet feeling so alone. Yeah. And life changes. So I have older children as well who've moved out, yet you still keep all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for what? For them to come back to? Actually, you're burdening them a little bit with 
holding on to that stuff. They're trying to create their own life. They've moved out. They've got married. They're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And you're holding these things. I don't mean memories aren't important, but you're holding on to a whole bunch of things like their room, hoping they'll come back. Mm -hmm. They don't need a specific room that was theirs to come and visit you or to come back. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted their stuff, they'd probably just take it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So you're actually burdening them and yourselves. So they're feeling guilty and thinking, oh, mum's kept that bedroom for me with all my things around. And you know, drawing them back in, whereas they'll just come, they come visit me in my one bedroom flat that they've never lived in. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm. No, that's really beautiful. Yeah. And it's, it's wholesome as well because they, yeah. they're there to see you, mm-hmm. uh, not there to see your stuff. And with my convertible furniture, we have three queen size beds in a one bedroom flat. Mm. So <laughs> if they want to sleep, they can sleep in a queen size bed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. And for your son, like how, how can you, for, um, how can you like train him or teach him um, all of minimalism and like, um, yeah, so he's grown up with a little bit more. So I have children from 27 down to 10, as you just met my son before we commenced. Yep. Uh, so he's right in the thick of my journey um, and he loves it. So he in, he will remind me about different things and he's not lacking in anything. It's quite um, quite funny to see, Like, but he doesn't have a shelf full of toys or choices um, like I would think my other children had. And it's that same concept of what do you need and can we go somewhere? So if we want to go out and do sport, you, it's all there. You don't have to have your own ball or your own posts or your own whatever. You can go to a lot of places and the share equipment is there. Um, during COVID, we did our mini Olympics down the beach and he was actually jumping rope, you know, with a vine that was attached to the sand dunes. And I just pulled it all the way out and sat on the other end and skip over the rope and he f- threw a javelin, which was a big stick. And yep. it was so much fun. I videoed it all and he just went, oh, it's my own mini Olympics. Oh. Like, yeah, so we didn't have anything. Oh, that <laughs> yeah. hits him hot. <laughs> I know, but it doesn't mean he doesn't um, crave, you know, and want brand name things. It's yep. okay. If he wants the Nike Air Jordans, I talk to him about that and I go, if that's the pair you're going to wear every day and that's the pair you love, let's get that pair. Mm. let's go get that one pair <laughs> mm. and let's wear them until they're done mm. you know and yeah no I've I, I, I've seen a lot of people um I've been surrounded by people who have a lot mm. and I have seen and it's it's hard when I talk to people who don't have um a lot of money and, and I say to them look I've seen people who have a lot of money and I know that they there's not a lot of happiness there. And look, in saying that, I have seen people who have a lot of money and are happy, <laughs> but it's not the money that made them happy or unhappy. No, they're it living was, the life they want. Exactly. Their life might be expensive because they love yachts. That's, yeah. that's okay. But they're not just getting a yacht because they've got money. Mm. They love sailing mm. and they're fortunate enough or made their way to get a yacht. And that's their thing that they love. So yep. that's why they're happy. Yep. It's doing what you love and pursuing that mm-hmm. rather than pursuing something that gives you money and hoping that I can buy a lifestyle that it. may satisfy me. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. Like I, I want, I don't need a Tesla at the moment. Mm. I love the concept around them. I love what they look like. I think it's, you know, all part of that minimalism piece as well in a Tesla. But they're expensive. They're really expensive. So I have to work and make decisions and everything that are going to make, you know, allow me that opportunity to have enough money to buy the Tesla. Will it make me happy? No more happy as a person, but yes, I'll be happy that that's the car I drive because I love it mm. it's o- and it's okay. Yep, yep, yep. And I mean, even for any new car, usually, I understand the idea around Tesla or even just an um, electric car in general is about helping the environment, yes. um, not spending money on fuel and so on. But for most new cars, you'll buy a new car and you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. And then you'll drive it for like a week. You'll be like, oh, and then a month. And then maybe like two months, three months, and then you're like, oh, okay, this is my car. It doesn't Four smell like a new car anymore. No, <laughs> it, has, it has footprints. You've mm-hmm. got maybe some makeup marks, mm-hmm. and now you're just getting into your car. And occasionally you're like, oh, good car, but it's just now a car. Absolutely, you know? yeah. It doesn't it doesn't change your your life. No, having a certain brand or whatever, but it's okay to want one. Mm. <laughs> mm. And it's interesting with electric cars because I actually think. Um, in the next few years, they're phasing out more and more petrol cars. So more and more brands are going either uh, dual or completely electric. Yeah. So that is... <laughs> I can't wait to join that wave. <laughs> very exciting. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. Particularly because I think um, there's a documentary years ago. It was like, who killed the electric car? Mm-hmm. And back then, um, it's like... I should actually know the exact dates, but they had um, an electric car that they'd released around the same time that they started creating the first petrol cars, but the petrol industry actually killed... killed. Yep. Same with um, Kodak and the film industry. So Kodak were the people who had the role of film 
and they were um, brought a digital camera to have a look at, like we have, all have on our phone now. And they went, if we did that, we wouldn't be able to sell any of our rolls of film. So we're not going to do it. And look what happened to Kodak. You know, so uh, consumption. It all down <laughs> That's to it. Mind. Great. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so you talk about excuses, and um, you write that so many people come up with excuses of why they can't do something rather than simply actually just getting it done. Mm-hmm. So do you want us to talk us through like? Yeah, it's there's the first excuse is uh, I'm going to. It's a timing excuse of when you know. Whereas you could actually, even whilst listening to this, go out and go. I'm actually going to put that one aside. I don't need it anymore. So timing is the first ex- excuse around why you can't um, have a better life or make a freer space for yourself. Um, there's other excuses um, which are the want need version. So that one comes up quite often as well. Uh, and yeah. The one you asked me at the beginning, I just don't know where to start. I'm overwhelmed by it all. Well, you can just turn around and start with the first thing you can reach, the first thing you can touch. And I've got experience in this. As I said, my mother's a hoarder. Hoarding is an actual illness. So it actually isn't so much about the collecting of the stuff. That's a um, a psychological effect of it all. And so I've been at her home and gone, let's start. And pretty much behind me as I'm sort of putting things in a bag and she's agreeing to remove them, she's putting them back on the shelf, you know. So it's it's not the same same thing. If someone's a hoarder, um, it's not about minimalism. That's an emotional thing they have to process. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, um, yeah. So unless you have one of those sort of illnesses, the excuse list is long, endless, and really you, you have to take it upon yourself to make a step to start and you can go backwards you can go three steps forward, two back. You just can't go three forward and four back because then you're <laughs> getting more and more stuff again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and so with, um, with hoarding as a condition so is it more that you attach the emotion to those items so you feel like a piece of your security with all these things around you so things make you feel like you have value or something to do even if you've got things to sort and stack and clean and place so it gives you a um, a feeling of security and purpose to have junk is Mm. is the main one yeah Mm, that's so interesting And so in that scenario, it would be more seeing somebody um, yeah, like a psychologist to actually yeah. sit down and work through yeah. that. Even the shows you see on TV where they help people clean out, if they actually went back and did a where are they now, you probably find most are back where they were. Wow. Mm-hmm. So making that long-term change, okay, let's say if you're not a severely um, a hoarder, how can you – mitigate against that so somebody decides okay i'm listening to the podcast i'm keen (laughs) i'm ready to clean out my stuff clean out my life um i don't need all of this stuff and then you start packing away and you're like uh what what's gonna grab a couple more out just one more i really wanted that dress i know next summer Mm -hmm. i'm gonna wear that dress i think communities podcasts like i still listen to a podcast and then we'll go oh I really need to do something more about this, whether it's mental clutter or whatever. So I think the communities and being interested in it as a topic, so being interested in minimalism and listening to what other people have done and reading books about it and going on retreats and things where people discuss how great it is keeps you constantly in that world. If you're just trying to do it on your own and you step away from that, it's easy enough to just pretend that you're minimizing or, like you said, taking things back again. So the quicker you can totally remove it as well like give it away the better less chance of you taking it back yeah and for mental clutter like how can somebody so we talk about journaling Mm -hmm. can help with mental clutter because you you, you're sorting your thoughts out um how would you talk about that for um what other ways can you declutter your mind i think as we we were having a little chat about retreats and things like that where you actually are taken away from all of that ability to communicate so gossiping and telling stories and embellishing your life to people when you can't speak, write or read and you're left to either meditate or sit with your own thoughts, you have to process them and you do end up with clear mind space. So um, Vipassana is just one example of that. There's other smaller versions and other um, other retreats you can go on. But when you remove the ability to use all those mental ways of um, filling your life, that's when you process the real issues. Wow, wow. So um, for Pasana guys is where mm-hmm. you are um, in this, if, if you haven't heard of it before, you're in this retreat um, and you can't speak to anyone. You can't even make eye contact um, and you eat like very little. You don't eat after 12 o'clock either, midday. So nothing until six o'clock the next day. Wow. Every day, yeah. So no writing, no reading, nothing. And 
um, you think it's very boring at the beginning and some people think it's quite peaceful for a couple of days, but then all that comes back to you is your own thoughts. That's all you have is your own stuff. So, and so what do you do? What, is that? Mm. <laughs> what do you do in that situation? <laughs> it, is, it actually just gets let go because you can't solve it. You, you come up with all these things about what you're going to do post-retreat. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to go to the bank and refinance my loan and do this and do that and do this. And then you're still there for another few days. And so you can't go and do anything. So it actually passes. And you're only left with the things you have to deal with when you get back. All the other stuff passes, which is crazy. But yeah. Wow. So it's when you got back, were you, when you got back, were you like, all right, <laughs> No, literally I got back. I found it a little bit difficult to engage and talk to people. I didn't have much to say, which is quite funny, um, from 10 days of silence. Uh, you just didn't need it. Um, I I didn't have this massive list. It, life just went on and the important things were just really clear to me. So um, the bank, for an example, I didn't go and refinance everything. What was important to me is that my bank manager understood what, what I needed and acted in my best interest. So I started conversations with him around saying, we've known each other for 10 years. You've never met me. You've never spoken to me more than, you know, if I need a loan. I'd really like you to understand what my long-term financial goals are and work with me as a bank. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and so I stayed with them. Wow, that's so empowering actually. Mm-hmm. Whereas I hated them and I was, I'm going to change banks. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Um, it was the conversation that I needed to have. Jeez, that's amazing. Yeah, Vipassana. Guys, if you're interested, <laughs> should check it out. It's <laughs> <laughs> hardest thing I've ever done. So I served in the military for almost 20 years and nothing I did in that space could compare to how hard Vipassana was for me. I almost wanted to leave, well, I wanted to leave every day. And the only reason I stayed was like, I can do this, I can do this. And then I think about just after the halfway mark, I, I gave into it and had the most amazing experience ever. And that, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So giving in as in I'm just surrendering. I just went, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck here. <laughs> I'm going to stop wondering when I'm going to get out and pretend I'm just here forever. And because the days just seem so long. Like I couldn't believe from day four to day five, it felt like a year of my life. <laughs> being there <laughs> and I, I um yeah I just kept thinking I don't need this I don't need this why would I be here I've got a great life I just need to get home and get into it you know but it's it is breaking you to that point where the only person you have is you wow. and and loving that person it sounds you know, a bit surreal but yeah loving that and accepting it is pretty big wow and so coming back now with that deep love for yourself what does that look like and what does that look like in your it's, ex- it's exciting. It's um, people often say, "Oh, you're always so happy," and it's like, actually, I am. I'm quite happy. I've always always been quite positive, but I'm actually really quite happy. And when difficult events happen, I just put one foot in front of the other and I get f- through them really quickly. So I had a f- my unit the other day flooded, and it, I got the phone call saying there's water coming down the stairs. You need to get here, and it was just like, okay, you know, it happens. Disappointing, mm-hmm. but the adrenaline doesn't fire up so much it's just a process happens to everyone call the insurer do this do that and I got there and I was actually kind of just smiling through it and the lady went I thought you'd be crying and it's like it doesn't solve anything like I might later because that's just a human emotion but right now just deal with it just deal and put one foot in front of the other and then sit back later on and decide whether it still needs a cry Mm. (laughs) yeah so powerful it may or may not yeah very powerful because it really is um what is valuable and what is valuable in this moment here and now because this moment here is all that exists. That's it. Right here, right now. Yeah. So powerful. Don't get too future focused. No. That's, that's big. The future will be. You've only got now. And got, Vipassana does that a lot too. It's beautiful. You've got a roof over your head. You've got food yeah. in your stomach. Your child's happy. Yep. What more, what more what do you more need you in this moment? Yeah. Everything else. It's great, but don't need it do you <laughs> there's one of the, one quote that gets me through so much is uh this too soon shall pass i like that mm. and it's true always does mm. always does and something more beautiful fills that space always uh, for me anyway I'm, i would you know, be interested in hearing other people's thoughts but um you know, i recently changed careers and at the time when they said oh you know we're going to change our workspace and you know probably not going to have these roles anymore I could feel my heart like just, I really want to stay here. I really loved it here. And within the afternoon I went, it's meant to be. I don't know why, but it's meant to be. And amazing opportunities just arrived. It was like, 
yeah, beautiful workplaces that have a different way of working, beautiful connections. Um, it happens straight away. Wow. Yeah. And so when you were living in this beautiful house with all these things, could you have ever imagined your life now? No, I wanted more things. Like even <laughs> I just kept thinking about when I was going to replace the sofa or put an extension on. So I, even then I was more, 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 more. I would never have dreamt it to be less. And with this forevermore, there is no end to that, is there? It never stops. No, You're never satisfied by more. You're only satisfied when you have enough. And you've got to decide what enough is. So powerful. <laughs> <laughs> and only you can decide. And enough for you might not be enough for me. And that's okay too. Yeah. Mm. So. But I think we talked a lot about the space. The other bit was the emotional piece. Um, it, it, oh, you'd be crazy if you said you'd never told a lie in your life. Um, but a lot of it's embellishing too. People will just exaggerate or... Um, they know as they're saying it, it's kind of just a safety lie. They're saying it because they don't want to hurt the person or whatever. I removed all of that from my life as well. So radical honesty policy mm. was a huge part of um, what I wrote in my book around the quicker you can tell the truth, that it sets you free. So even if you say something that's a half truth, immediately that you know it's come out of your mouth, just go, actually, no, that was rubbish. <laughs> the truth is actually this. Yeah, It sits beautifully with everyone. It doesn't have to be said in a mean way, but it can be truthful. So that's the mental clutter that I changed. And how has that transformed your life, being honest with yourself <sighs> and honest with others? It is refreshing. People see you as genuine because you are. Um, it's challenging sometimes like because you, you do know, and the more you practice it, you do know when you're about to say something that's not quite right. Uh, it's funny with the kids, um, my son, <laughs> I won't lie, anywhere. So even at school, I go, oh, it's Friday afternoon. Do you want to head to the coast? We'll go off school early. We'll nick off at 2 o'clock. He goes, oh, I'll need a note. And I go, okay. So I write out the note. Uh, it's a beautiful weekend. We've decided to leave school at 2 o'clock and head to the coast. He goes, no, 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 the note about the doctor. <laughs> and I said, we're not going to the doctor. And the ladies at the front counter of the school are so funny now when I walk in because they used to say, so shall we put down doctor? Are you here to get your son? And I went, no, we've had this chat. Yeah. I'm taking him a little bit early to beat the traffic. You can pop that on the note. It's okay. Mm. Yeah. So. Mm. And it's at the end of the day, like, it's your child. <laughs> and, it's, and it's okay. Grade five, two hours of school, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. Like, yeah. what would they really learn in that period? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the school, and that's what I said to them, um, I know at the school you're teaching them not to lie, and I'm just practicing the same principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's okay, like, to do that. Because <laughs> the amount of people that probably would just put a doctor, because it's easy, and they know, okay, well, I know that this will work, even though mm -hmm. it's the same reason and the people would be willing to accept that. Yeah. And their children hear them say it. Mm. Go, Mummy just lied to my principal. Mm. Like what example does that set? And he goes, aren't you scared of what they're going to say, Mum? And I said, no, I'm never scared of the truth. Never scared of the truth. The truth is just what it is, the wow. truth. It's nothing else. So it's so freeing. And I don't have to remember anything that I've said that wasn't the truth. It just, it's just there. Yeah. Wow. 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 And there was a lawyer that told me a radical honesty policy. Tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth as soon as you can. Mm. <laughs> That's very true. And like particularly um, with children, because if you think about it, if they accept that as normal, because every child through their development, de developmental process, particularly from the age of like zero to seven, they really set the foundations for their entire life. And what does that all look like? And what is right and what is wrong? And I think they've done some studies where they look at children at a young age and see what their um, ethics are. Mm -hmm. And then they look at them again when they're a bit older. And they found that their cultural norms, because they've habituated into that, don't actually really change. Um, once they're embedded in that, they're like, okay, well, this is how I view the world. This is what's truth. And, you know, it's okay to lie. And it's and, and so by you instilling that, and be like, well, no, just actually tell the truth. And, you know, no, you don't need to consume everything that you see. Yeah. You're not just a consumer. You're a human being. <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's, it's just okay. It's like you don't. Don't, don't tell me you're sick. Just tell me you don't want to go to school today because there's something on television. Doesn't The outcome might not be what you're after. You might still go to school. But at least tell me the reason why and we can have this normal, beautiful, open discussion about that and about why. Authentic. Yeah, authentic. authentic Same with the minimalism piece. Just be authentic with it. 
you don't have to throw everything away <laughs> to claim you're a minimalist. You have to be authentic about going, I really tried my best and I really feel this is the stuff that I need and I'm going to give that a go. Mm. Mm. And um, so how do you define success? You write um, everyone following a similar path of this um, white picket fence kind of lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, so success for for me is everyone's own individual version of that. So I have no judgment about someone who wants to live in the big seven bedroom house still. Um, it's it's success is when, yeah, you sit there and you go, I've actually created a life that works for me and that makes me happy. So, mm. yeah. But then finding that happiness with the house is amazing and the seven bedroom house is beautiful mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful accomplishment but the happiness isn't attached to that seven bedroom house no. is it no the happiness is from within you and what all the things you're doing including your family your career all those things and i guess success also is when you know it doesn't feel right making the change and that doesn't mean the next thing that you choose might be 100% right either it's the whole journey of being brave enough to try and find the best life for you Mm. Mm. And it's, I found like um, also happiness um, sometimes isn't always also a constant. You know, it's a state of being, not an end result. It's like yeah. people are like, oh man, when I get this, then <laughs> I will be, be happy. happy. Yeah. So they yeah. work like crazy yeah. and then they get it and then they're like, when I get this, I will be happy. There's a book called This and it's This Is Not That. And I can't think of the author right now, but they're just saying, you know, this is what it is right now. That is something that may happen or has happened. It's all this and that. I think it's quite a cute way of looking at it. Mm. Well, well, I mean, like, I haven't found, um, well, so when I was, I was traveling, I was like, I wanted to travel for ages and I was like working, working, and then I quit my job, um, started traveling and then stayed there for ages. And even during that process, I was like, I was looking forward to traveling for so long. And this is amazing. It's mind blowing. But I've noticed even when I look around me and I feel like I have everything that I've ever wanted, I still go through fluctuations of being super happy and sometimes being not so happy. And rather than saying, oh, man, if only I had this, then I'd be happy. I'm I'm actually like taking a step back and being like, all right, um, I know that this is just a moment and I know that this will pass and I'm just going to sit in solitude. I'm going to breathe, do some meditation, do some yoga because I know that that always makes me feel good um, and then just appreciate what is because I know that whether this is good or bad, it will it still will pass. pass. Yeah, The good and passes as well, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Yeah. It does. In some moments you're like, oh man, I'm loving life. I'm owning <laughs> everything. And then some days you're like, I just, I just don't want to, like I just don't feel so good. And it's having those techniques that you spoke about, but you've got to practice to find out what's your technique Mm. for when it's not feeling so good. Mine is definitely the outdoors, beach. doesn't matter if it's raining, anywhere where I can connect and ground myself, like literally take my feet off and do some grounding. Mm. That's what I know works for me, but that's only practice and being honest again with myself and going, actually, that does work for me. It's not just something I saw on a show. (laughs) That feels good. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. So for people to try and find that which refuels them, what sort of advice would you give them to try and cultivate that? Yeah, I think you've got to um, be looking around at all the different options. And you do have to attend. You do have to go and not just go once. So even yoga, people will go once and go, "Eh, maybe not for me. I think you've got to give these things a bit of a run. Um, It might not be that yoga centre that was right for you or that style of yoga that was right for you. So we all know what you know things are recommended there's enough out there in the media of saying you know meditation yoga all these things but there's some really different um i guess add-ons you know your reikis and all that sort of thing and if you don't explore any of them you won't know Mm -hmm. and there's certainly some that aren't for me i just they just didn't resonate they weren't awful Mm -hmm. (laughs) i'd rather a traditional two-hour thai massage you know with some beautiful oil than (laughs) meditation but that's i don't mind meditation but the massage the actual physical connection and touch of the strength of a massage Mm. is for me so they've got to go and try um and do a lot of things that are free try it yourself google it youtube it have a go yourself Mm. yeah that's very true and yeah i actually found like um with yoga initially i was like oh i'm really into working out and um, i'm really into training Go, go, go. And I found that I loved hot yoga. I'm not, oh, yeah, well, I loved hot I yoga. Love but hot yoga. So good. Um, but the more, like, the more I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced, I found yoga is good and, um, like, X is very fast. Um, power yoga is awesome. But sometimes, like, lying there. Yin yoga. And just, like, favorite. Getting in, getting, 
relaxing, releasing. Like it, it honestly, you start to release your your mind. You release like you'll you'll lie in those postures, and then similar. Well, I mean, the personal would be like extended, <laughs> but you start thinking about all these things, and then you lie there, and it's like a few more minutes, and you're still lying there, and then you're like, ah, <sighs> yes. Yeah, and I feel like they're talking to me up the front when they go, it's not a competition, you don't have to push yourself in yoga. And I'm like, I can hear them talking to me thinking, that's me, I'm trying to stretch extra hard or I'm trying to make sure the girl beside me is not further into the pose than me. You know, and eventually you just let go and go, my pose is my pose and lean into it and then the whole session is beneficial. Beautiful. And so let's talk about your book. So tell us all about that. And <laughs> yeah. So uh, for my 50th birthday, I just decided I was going to write a book that was a gift to myself. And like most things, I like to do things quickly. I don't, I didn't want to write a book over three years or it's just the way I, I accept that I like to do it fast. So I found this um, thing, I think it was LinkedIn, but it was 48 hour author. So within 48 hours, you will have a book in your hand. So you, you attend this retreat and you dictate into a um, you know, dictaphone and then it gets sent off and basically a book comes back to you. Um, yeah, so 48 hours in a winery. So lucky I didn't drink too much wine, so I got it finished. <laughs> uh, it took a while during COVID then to publish, but um, Minimalist Me is an authentic minimalist book. So, But surprisingly, even though I told them I was writing about minimalism, they can constantly told me I needed more pages, more chapters, more stuff. And I'm like, I don't think you get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's minimalism. So I only want, because the ideal book length apparently is 12 chapters. I only wanted 10. Um, the ideal chapter size is a certain size. I didn't want that. Uh, so it took ages and then got got it down to my 10. And then I went to the book cover design and they showed me all these covers and I went, I want black and white. They go, Nobody does a black and white cover. And I go, again, I think you're missing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want a black and white cover. Um what do you want shiny white paper inside no I want like whatever the most minimalist paper you've got yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah so the book's got um little quotes and every chapter has a little um exercise that people can do to get started which is just simple like the five whys or the boxing technique or the coat hanger technique they're all in there mm. yeah beautiful and so your um how it how it kind of transitions or the key points for for those listening who are, you know might be tempted to to buy it what is that yeah so it does go through all of the physical the mental and the space side of things um so the tips are though you can just pick any chapter you like so it's not a read like a novel that you need to start at the beginning you can just go to the index or just open a page and go you know what for today i'm going to do minimalist um minimal lies there's a chapter called minimal lies and you're just going to start there so you don't have to read it back end to front end. You can just do a chapter whenever you feel like it and then pick it up again another day when you think that one was inspirational and try another one. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And where exactly will they find? Um, yeah, it's on Amazon. It is called Minimus Me, Who the and Bleep Bleep Is She um, because I don't consider myself a total minimalist in the traditional sense. Uh, so it's there. I'm actually doing um, a Radiance seminar in Cairns in October and so I'll have the book. I don't um, – I give a lot of them away. Again, it's not um, for the money-making side of it. I have a full-time job, um, but it is available to be purchased as an ebook or online through Amazon. Beautiful. And so for those listening, where can they find you? Where can they yeah. find? I am on, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, as a, as a professional, but um, I have uh, the Minimalist Australia is the company name. So we have our own website. Um, we're not massively active on there. Um, we do a little blog and a few little bits and pieces, but it's more about people sharing around it. So yeah, we have a Facebook page as well. So the Minimalist Australia is us. Beautiful. And so you would also help people if they would like to um, declutter their lifestyle, you would help in that process? Absolutely. And I'm not doing it as a charge service at the moment. We normally look at whatever we could reciprocate. So what kind of things are they into? And could we come to something? There's always something someone else has. So it's not an hourly rate and you pay an amount. It's what are you into? Someone might be on a farm and I'll go, okay, why don't we go for a big walk around your farm and then I'll spend two hours helping you get started. So yeah, it's not about spending hours with them paying me a thousand dollars to box up all their things it's about getting them started beautiful 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 and um one of the questions i just i love to finish with is if you could um have one message uh, to the world what would it be yeah um with less you have more beautiful Mm -hmm. beautiful and uh with that vicky thank you so much for joining us today it's beautiful to 